Welcome to uh, the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and the Center on U.S. Power and Politics Transatlantic Currents event on Russia, sanctions, and the transatlantic relationship more broadly. I am Charlie Salonis Pasternak. A few months since a few months back, I um, run CUSP, but none of you uh, signed up to listen to me. So I'm just very briefly going to say uh, thank you for participating, but thank you um, for one of our permanent hosts of this series, Ambassador Deborah McCarthy. She's a fellow at Harvard. She also has about a 30 year experience in national security and diplomacy. She was the U.S. ambassador to Lithuania uh, from 2013 to 2016. And uh, most recently, one of the things I can greatly suggest you uh, start listening to is a podcast she produces, The Ambassador and the General. Uh, there's a really good episode on the Arctic uh, about a month back and uh, most recently one on uh, Libya's civil, civil war. Uh, but Deborah, I hand the reins over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I'm very pleased to be here today for another one of our series of webinars with Dan Freed, whom in full disclosure was key to my success in my diplomatic career when he offered me a position in Greece. I don't know if you remember, Dan. As you all know, the series is bringing in a, a number of American experts in a wide range of fields on topics of mutual interest. And Charlie has noted that our topic today will be Russia, sanctions, and the transatlantic relationship. Ambassador Freed is currently a Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow with the Atlantic Council. He's also on the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy and a visiting professor at Warsaw University. He has had a very distinguished career in the diplomatic service and served as the first and only so far State Department coordinator for sanctions policy from 2013 to 2017. He also served as special assistant and National Security Council senior director for Presidents Clinton and Bush. He was the U.S. ambassador to Poland and he was the assistant secretary of state for Europe. His other postings included then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, Belgrade, and Warsaw. He also served as the State Department's first special envoy for the closure of the Guantanamo detainee facility. What I thought we'd do today is ask Ambassador Free to make some opening general remarks, not very long on the general topic, and then I will jump in with a few specific questions to get the ball rolling, and then we'll open it up to this distinguished audience. Thank you for participating. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Deborah, it's a pleasure. Great to, well, I, on the whole, I'd rather be in Helsinki. I'd rather be outside of Washington. I haven't been outside of Washington in 14 months. So yeah, um, here we are. Um, Ambassador McCarthy asked me to start with an assessment of US-Russian relations, and this is absolutely right, because sanctions are a policy tool. They are not a policy. And simply sanctions is an abstract question, right? Do we sanction, do we not? What are we trying to achieve? What are our goals? The Biden administration, in my judgment, is off to a good start advancing a balanced and sustainable policy toward Russia. And that consists of, first of all, cooperation where it is possible. The first, I mentioned that first because the first act the Biden administration took in relations with Russia was to extend the New START Treaty. Cooperation. Secondly, pushing back against Kremlin aggression, which is taking place in many areas. And the Biden administration from the first spoke clearly about Kremlin aggression. Um, it did not obfuscate. It did not cover the landscape with snow to obscure it and make it look prettier than it is, like a junkyard, you know, in after a winter storm. Um, the administration spoke clearly and has acted, but I'll get into its actions later. The administration, however, makes it clear wants to stabilize the relationship, neither engage in a faux reset nor escalate. But it is prepared to escalate if it has to. And that was the underlying meaning of the sanctions package. 
before last. Um, finally, and although the Biden administration has not talked about a lot about this, it is a fact that U.S. actions with respect to Russia also include reaching out to Russian society. And that is a long term investment. And the United States during the Cold War got pretty good at that kind of thing. Um, support for democratic dissidents, frankly, or independent journalism is something that is not the U.S. government doesn't take the lead, but American organizations do. Putin knows it and he hates it. But a balanced and sustainable policy policy toward Russia has to include all of these elements. And to get European buy-in to a policy, which is important, we need to have a co a, an element of cooperation and stabilization. But well, it's good policy. It's also necessary to get European buy-in. But the Europeans have to also be on board for pushing back against Russian aggression. A special word about Finland. I was the negotiator of our sanctions after the Russian after the Kremlin attack on Ukraine in 2014. And I consulted with Finland. Finland had a lot of equities and a lot of vulnerabilities. And I want to express thanks to Finland, which supported the sanctions in the EU despite taking a hit. And I was, a, I was aware that these were costly to Finland. And Finland stood up for common values. And I just wanted to express appreciation for that. I was appreciative at the time. And I still am. Now, there's more to say, particularly about sanctions. But um, Deborah, you wanted me to outline things rather than um, drone on. So that's it. And I am happy to answer any and all questions about the Biden approach, the Biden team, sanctions, the sanctions package, what comes next. I mean, the whole the whole thing. Excellent. Well, I thought I'd start with something fundamental, which is the the fundamental question, the use of sanctions as a national security tool. As you've noted, the purpose of sanctions is to create conditions for their removal. In other words, to change behavior. In the case of Iran, criteria were worked out in the process of negotiating the JCPOA. Iran began taking steps on its nuclear plans and some sanctions were lifted. In the case of Russia, the story seems to be more mixed. While some criteria for lifting have been clear, such as Russia withdrawing from Crimea, others have not been. And this leads to arguments as to their impact. So my question is, how do you assess the effectiveness of the US and EU sanctions on Russia in terms of their ultimate objective? And what additional steps do we need to take with our European partners? Again, going back to the criteria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you've asked the right question. OK, there, there are lots of right questions, but this is one of them. Um, the problem we have had we, the West, and in particular, the United States has had dealing with Putin's aggression is that there is so much of it in so many areas. And the, the sanctions, the first U.S. sanctions against, the, against Russia in the post-Cold War era were about human rights. It was the Magnitsky Act, mm. which the Obama administration was, they didn't like it. They were reluctant to, um, to implement it. And as sanctions coordinator, I simply grabbed that one and was in charge of the implementation, working with other elements of the US government. So that was that's human rights sanctions. The strong economic sanctions were put on after the Russian attack on Ukraine. And the deal we made with the Europeans is, you know, it's a handshake deal, not a formal deal, but it's it's a serious one, is that if the Russians, if the Kremlin gets out of the Donbass, and restores the Donbass and the eastern Ukrainian border to Ukrainian sovereignty, we have to take down the sanctions that were imposed because of that attack. The Crimea sanctions stay until Crimea is returned to um, Ukraine, which is probably going to be a long time. Think of the Baltic states. But we made that deal. Now, it's complicated by the fact that Putin didn't stop with attacking Ukraine, he also interfered in US elections and European elections and is 
tried to uh, uh, and actually assassinated people overseas, engaged in sabotage, blowing up an ammun ammunition in the Czech Republic, killing two Czech citizens. Um, you know, this is a whole but military, various kinds of provocations. Um, there's a whole list of malign behavior. And it complicates our ability to deal with this. It also means that if there were a deal on Ukraine, on, on the Donbass, it might be more complicated to remove the sanctions because of other aspects of, of Kremlin malign behavior, but we would have to do it anyway. We would have to figure out those sanctions that were imposed because of the attack on the Donbass, and I would support the removal, okay? Despite the fact that I have also supported additional sanctions for other malign um, Kremlin acts. We can't simply move the goalposts. We have to be consistent. And it's not a shock, Deborah, you know this, I have a reputation as a hawk on Putin. I'm dealing with Putin's Russia. And as a hawk, and I don't shy away from that label, I would argue that we would have to take down the sanctions. Now that's a good problem to have because it presupposes that there's actually a deal. In the meantime, there is no deal. This is an abstract conversation. What is happening is Putin is continuing his malign activity, although last week he seemed, seemed, and I'm being cautious now, to step back from the brink on a couple of issues. You remember that there was a Russian military, <laughs> no need to tell Finns, there was a major Russian military buildup directed against Ukraine, and there was the fear that he would actually go in and fight. Now, I did not share that concern, not because I have trust in Putin's goodwill, but because the Ukrainians would not have given up. They would have made Putin fight a war. They might not have won, but they would have made a real fight of it, and that means a land war between Russian and Ukrainian regular forces. And that means a lot of dead Russians which is not popular in Russia, and the Kremlin knows it. So I, I wasn't saying there would never be a Russian attack. I remember the Russo-Georgian War of 2008. But I was not one of the alarmists. I thought that Putin was testing our nerves and doing a kind of maskirovka, that is, pushing and seeing how we would react. Well, frankly, the West reacted pretty well. The Biden administration pushed back. It was organized. Chancellor Merkel pushed back, and the Biden administration organized sanctions. The sanctions package was generally not about Ukraine that came out week before last, but it indicated that the United States was organized. And I wrote something also that um, week before last outlining our escalatory options should I be wrong and Putin actually send in the troops. And guess what? We have a lot of escalatory options a lot. And I don't mean things like cutting off the Russians from SWIFT, which the Europeans don't like. No, no, no. I mean, short of that, steps strong enough to hurt, not so strong that we couldn't actually take them. I wrote about it. I mean, look it up. The fact is, we, the West, need to be prepared to push back against Russian malign behavior. And we need to have Putin understand that we are so prepared. And if we are so prepared, maybe he will find a way not to take those steps because he is not crazy. He's very smart. And like Kremlin leaders, he is good at judging costs and benefits. Again, no need to tell Finns any of this. Um, you know, my Polish friends will tell me that they envy Finland because they, the Poles, would have liked to have done in 1939 what Finland did in 1939, which is hold off the Soviets. Poles couldn't because they were attacked first from the West by Germany. But they admire Finland because Finland fought and preserved its sovereignty because it fought. So no need, to, God forbid, we get in, I'm not advocating a war. God, for, God forbid, terrible thing. But the preparation to resist by preparing sanctions and letting know that the Russians know that we are so prepared can act, not always, but can act somewhat as a deterrent. Now, I've gone on 
but you ask, you ask the right question, okay? And I've been thinking about this. I give the Biden administration pretty high marks for how they've handled things. Well, I wanted to dive a little, whoops, we have a little echo. Want to dive in a little bit more on this latest package, which had some very interesting elements. It was done in, re in retaliation for the solar winds attack, the election interference, and other Russian accent, actions. The measures included in particular a ban on U.S. financial institutions buying Russian government debt in primary markets. What makes this different from previous packages? The, the package was wrapped around a new executive order on Russia sanctions. And that new executive order um, was designed for maximum flexibility. And instead of being focused solely on Russian aggression against Ukraine, it was broader. It was focused on Russian foreign aggression generally. And it gave the United States more tools and more flexibility to respond to actions in the future. The sanctions package itself was a mid-sized package. It wasn't minimal, but it wasn't heavy. It felt like the middle option plus. The plus was the clear signaling that we have the ability to do much more and very quickly, so watch out. That was well done. It was not an extreme package. The move, the, the strongest single element was, as you say, this restriction on sovereign debt. And it was for ruble denominated as opposed to just dollar denominated. So it was a stronger step than this step the Trump administration took. But it was not a huge step because it allowed trading on Russian debt on the secondary market. You really want to mess with um, Russian finances, then start to start to make start to make secondary debt trading difficult but that might have meant some blowback among um western companies and institutions that in good faith purchased it it isn't in it is a warning that there is now a much greater risk premium than needs to be factored in to russian sovereign debt and institutions that hold it had better think about that because they are putting their faith in Vladimir Putin not to escalate. Like, you want to explain that to your shareholders? If your assessment goes wrong, I'd start getting out of it slowly. The Biden administration was clearly signaling that this is an escalatory path it could take, but did not this time. Um, that's pretty subtle. I know the people in the Biden administration who have been thinking about sanctions for a while. I mean, that's Peter Harrell, Dalip Singh at the NSC. That's Liz Rosenberg over at Treasury. These are serious people. They're the ones you want in charge, okay? Um, you know, that the fact that the team that team was there gave me a lot of confidence that they'd come up with a solid package. Um, the mild office at state, the sanctions coordinator's office needs to be reconstituted. I think they will because state you know, they have a lot of expertise, but n not enough weight in sanctions. But look, the Biden team did a pretty good job. The point is that they used sanctions in a subtle rather than blundering way. Um, Deborah, you mentioned something earlier, and I agree with it. You talked about the Iran sanctions, remember? And you made the point that the Iran sanctions succeeded in getting Iran to sign on to the JCPOA. Exactly. The, the Trump administration got greedy. Secretary of State Pompeo had a list of 13 demands he made against Iran, all of which were, you know, they were real. I mean, they, they addressed real areas of bad Iranian behavior. But the notion that we could take sanctions and, and Iran would basically surrender is getting greedy. Sanctions work if you don't expect too much of them. They are not, and they are also not going to work we're probably not going to work according to the timetable that you laid out in your memo to the president or the secretary. They can have unexpected consequences. Sometimes those unexpected consequences are good, but they may be long delayed. 
don't run a sanctions program held against the clock. Well, I wanted to turn now to another set, which is those uh, actions designed to stop Nord Stream 2. In the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 21, Congress called for more action to stop the pipeline. The law passed with strong bipartisan uh, support and called for consultations with relevant European governments before the imposition of new sanctions. Early in February, the Biden administration went ahead with some measures um, against Nord Stream 2. So I have a sort of a joint question here. Is there room, is there still room to develop a common plan of action with Europe or did this first step preclude it? And what other steps should the U.S. and its allies take to prevent Russia from using the pipeline as an economic tool? So you notice that clause in the in the um, Nord Stream led legislation calling for consultations with Europe. Good for you. you know, your pros instincts have not left you. That's that's an important that's important, and I'm going to get back to it. But good for you for noticing it because that was there not by accident. Okay, so here's my take on Nord Stream 2. One, it's a really bad idea. Basically, the Polish and Ukrainian and other European, like the Green Party and the European Parliament, basically the strategic arguments against it are right. It's a bad idea, not because there's something bad necessarily about all Russian gas, but because Nord Stream 2 gives Russia the ability to sell gas to its preferred customer, Germany, while bypassing um, customers that it may want to squeeze, like Poland, Ukraine, the Baltic states. And if you think that Russia won't, if you think the Kremlin won't squeeze countries when it can get away with it, you haven't been paying attention for the past, num for the past number of years. Of course it will. Nord Stream 2 gives Putin additional leverage. It's a bad idea. Two, sanctions are, a, an ex, are an expensive way to deal with a real problem. Now, the sanctions legislation was not quite as aggressive as Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz makes it out to be, but it could be escalated. And it is, it is a rough, it, it does push the administration in the direction of sanctioning a project to death. That is going to be costly in terms of relations with Germany. I think Germany made a policy mistake with Nord Stream 2. I've said it before. I'll say it right here. It was a mistake. But making a mistake is not the same as being the source of the problem. Putin is the problem. Germany is not the problem. They made a policy mistake. As an American, like I'm familiar with, with policy mistakes. We've made, we Americans have made lots of them. And when you make a mistake, you need your allies to help you out and not turn you into the problem. Germany is not the problem. What do we do? Well, you asked the right question. My old friend and colleague, Dick Morningstar, who knows the, he knows energy issues <clears throat> better than I ever will, <clears throat> and I and our friend Dan Stein wrote a piece arguing that there may be a way to mitigate the downside risks of Nord Stream 2. But the fact is, Nord Stream 2 is a bad idea, but Europe, and that includes Poland, and also Ukraine, are far less vulnerable to Russian gas pressure than they were 15 years ago. A lot less vulnerable. This has been a major European policy success and a Polish national policy success and Ukrainian policy success that deserves credit. What's an example of this? Well, 15 years ago, Putin cut off the gas to Ukraine and Ukraine economy was starved for gas. The lights went out. Okay, this was bad. Now, Ukraine still uses Russian gas, but it doesn't use any of the gas transiting through the Russian pipeline in um, Ukraine for its own economy. It sends all that gas west. The gas it uses for its economy is Russian gas that turns around in Germany and comes into Ukraine from the, from the west which means it's harder for Russia to cut off Ukraine without also cutting off its, wet, its German customers. Poland has lowered its dependency. It's still dependent on Russian gas, but less so. 
LNG terminals, a new pipeline from, um, from Norway, um, and it's working with the Baltic states. The Poles aren't just whining about Nord Stream, they're actually doing stuff. I mean, I know the Polish Energy Special Envoy, he's a smart, focused, very tough guy. He's the guy you want in charge of this. And Germany, you know, Europe in general, because of the network of secondary pipelines and LNG is less vulnerable to Russian gas cutoffs. So what do we do? Is it possible to reduce the still extant Kremlin leverage on gas? And is it possible to put in place contingency measures like contingency sanctions? So if the Russians do cut off Ukraine from gas, depriving it of the of the two to three billion dollars a year revenue, which is the principal leverage the Russian have, Russians have. Is that possible? Is it possible to mitigate the risks of downs uh, of Nord Stream 2 so that the Poles and Ukrainians who will never like it? will at least be able to say, we still hate Nord Stream 2, but we are less vulnerable than we would have been. Now, that the, the legislation that you mentioned had this consulta consultation clause, which means Congress was interested in consultations. I believe the Biden administration is interested, at least in theory, in consultations, but it can't do it alone. The Germans have got to, to make this possible. Meanwhile, of course, you know that the Greens, who have opposed Nord Stream 2 on both environmental grounds, but also security grounds, maybe in the government. So the thing to do now is to pause construction on Nord Stream 2 and suspend the implementation of all U.S. sanctions and give everybody time to work this out. Maybe give it time to so we revisit after the German elections. I am a believer. Look, I was a professional diplomat for 40 years. I'm a believer in trying to make the best deal you can. Perfection, not on this earth. You know, what did Immanuel Kant say? From the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing can ever be made. And there was a man on the Baltic who, who understood reality. You see what I'm saying? Isn't it better to try to work a deal that takes care of everybody's interests in a way that is less costly than to have a very satisfying fight. Now look, let's just stipulate. The Poles are really mad because they've been warning about Nord Stream 2 and they've been right. Let's just say the Poles are right and they've been right for years. And it's just not cool when Germans lecture Poles to calm down about Russia. Like, no, no. But, you know, it may, I think it would be possible to talk to the Poles if, you know, the Germans stop pretending that the Poles made up this issue and that it's not that Russian gas is not really a problem. Okay, you know, stop. So let's stop pretending the problem doesn't exist. And let's stop pretending that Nord Stream 2 has no strategic significance. The German president says it does have strategic significance as a bridge between Germany and Moscow because of World War II. Like, really? Um, the Poles have something to say about that, too, as do the Ukrainians. This ought to be worked out in a way that is, shows a maximum of European solidarity. The point of Nord, the bad part about Nord Stream 2 is that it breaks apart the integrity of the European gas market by making some countries like Germany favored and other countries like Poland disfavored. A European solution means everybody's equal. I think the Poles could get behind that. That's what they've been saying. The Germans ought to get behind that. The French have expressed misgivings about Nord Stream 2. The European Parliament hates it. The, the Greens hate it. So like, huh, let's do the deal. Okay, Deborah, you asked about Nord Stream 2. You got more of an answer than you wanted. <laughs> well, let me turn, well, let me to, turn one to one additional question oh, before gosh. we open it up. And that is um, going back to the use of sanctions as a tool. It's but one tool. And you have repeatedly argued for using sanctions against kleptocrats 
and in the case of Russia, the kleptocrats, the sustain and profit from Putin. I worked on several countries on sanctions years ago, where when we targeted some kleptocrats and their families, action was taken, especially targeting also families to prevent them from, you know, shopping in Miami or Madrid. So my question is, is do you sense that that would be a possible tool going forward, depending on behavior and within our sanctions community, is that feasible in terms of current legislation and how the team approaches the tool of sanctions? Oh, that is such a good idea. That is such a good idea. Um, in 2014, we started going after Putin's cronies. Not against all Russian oligarchs, but those oligarchs and bag men and people associated with Putin who are part of his inner circle. So we did that starting in 2014. The Trump administration did a little bit of that, but they were so clumsy and their policy toward Putin was so incoherent, right? Trump loved him, right? The administration was skeptical, but Trump was on Putin's side. I mean, absolutely disgusting, happily not the subject of this of, the, of this discussion. Um, that is an area that we ought to look at, and we ought to look at it systematically, not just targeting individuals, though I think that the U.S. administration should be prepared to do so, okay? You have to ask yourself, why are we, the West, allowing the Russians to attack our system and seek to undermine it while they take advantage of it? They park their money in the West because it's safer than it is in Russia. Their children go to school. They buy property and art as a way of, as a means of money laundering. And, you know, it's property in London, Miami, New York, other places in Europe. Um, they use all kinds of countries. No, should should Russian corrupt investors be allowed to purchase EU, EU passports? That's a question to Finland. Like, really? Um, is the United States justified in was it we, were we justified in keeping um, LLCs you know, confidential with hidden ultimate beneficial owners for years and years? You know what are we doing? Well, let's let's. Stop this. Let's dry up the sources of corrupt Russian money and mean it. And it's not just Russian, it's everybody. We ought to have financial transparency. And this is not so much an issue for OFAC, the, the Treasury office that does financial sanctions. It's more of an issue for FinCEN, the financial, um, you know, the, the financial crimes unit of Treasury that probably should be given more resources and beefed up the way OFAC was beefed up after 9-11. We need to do this together. Common regulatory norms. I'm all for this. I'm all for working with the commission and getting and putting together common standards. And the Biden administration has been talking about this. And they're really smart people over there that have been thinking about this for a while. It's not just sanctions. It's financial transparency. Look, isn't Finland noted as one of the cleanest, least corrupt countries on the planet? I mean, I keep hearing that and it doesn't surprise me. So, you know, Finland, take a lead in this, right? Financial transparency and making it clear to Putin that the days of his ability to un try to undermine the West uh, with one hand and take advantage of the West on the other are over. Not going to allow it. It's also a broader tool, as you say, to fight corruption across across the globe. And that is of great interest to the Biden administration, very much so. Well, I think we'll take a pause here and open it up to questions. I know that Charlie is monitoring uh, the chat to see what our audience is interested in discussing. So I'll turn it over to you, Charlie. Well, let's let's start with a question. I, I'll just quickly comment on the buying of passports. It's certainly something that shows up in the Finnish discussion every now and then, because it is such an easy way to sidestep restrictions that, for instance, in Finland have been placed on uh, purchase of land or, or structures near military buildings or, or such things. So it certainly comes up. Um, 
my sense is that most Finnish officials feel a little frustrated that they can't do too much about it, uh, essentially. Uh, yeah, no, that. Then the question from uh, Juan Reinde. Uh, During the Trump administration, Congress took a major role in the U.S. sanctions policy, especially against Russia. Was this problematic or a necessary trend in your view? And to what extent do you expect this trend to continue during the Biden administration? Um, and does this have any implications for Europe? Um, it was both problematic and necessary. Congress usually acts to restrict administration latitude for action when it doesn't have confidence in the administration. So Congress pushed the Obama people hard on Iran sanctions. And in retrospect, Congress was probably right. The Obama administration was too reluctant to squeeze the Iranians. But when we did, we got the JCPOA. With the Trump administration, there was in the in the early months of the Trump administration, Congress was concerned that the Trump team would unilaterally rescind the sanctions on Russia. Let me say that there was a basis for this concern. There was a basis for this concern. So Congress passed CATSA, the a comprehensive sanctions bill that, among other things, limited the ability of the executive branch to um, rescind san Russia sanctions without Congress's approval. Now, normally I'm against this kind of legislation. In this case, I was reluct I reluctantly favored it, and I wish I didn't have to because I don't usually like this kind of, of um, legislation, but the, the concern was real. There was a basis for it. Um, the way to avoid future such legislation is to have the, the Biden administration gain the confidence of Congress that it's going to do the right thing. Now, Nord Stream 2, you have somebody like Senator Cruz as a fire breather, and he wants the fight. But, but, if the Biden administration is able to work and present you know, an alternative way forward that takes care of not just of U.S. interests, but the interests of the most vulnerable countries like Poland and Ukraine, there's a chance um, to the Congress will not pass additional restrictive legislation. And the current legislation has just enough room in it to allow for the suspension of sanctions if there's a deal based on a national interest standard rather than a national security standard, which sounds, that's in the legislation, it sounds technical, but trust me, that's an, a, an important difference. So what I did with it during the, during the Obama administration to stay ahead of Congress on, on Russia sanctions legislation was to go up and tell them whatever they had in mind, I had in mind even more. Just let me do my thing. And Europe came through, okay, because we acted with Europe, I was able to go to the Congress and say, look, we've got a common front with Europe. You didn't think it was possible. Putin didn't think it was possible. But the European Union has stood up. So don't screw this up. I didn't put it quite that way, though in private meetings I kind of did. And Deborah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, don't screw this up. Let European American solidarity against Putin stand for itself. Putin will get the message, and I think he did. Great, uh, thank you. Um, it's it's a little bit too early, but I, I'll I'll ask Deborah first. Do you have any follow up questions or thoughts? Because absolutely, um, I wanted to go back to something you said in the beginning, which is. Um, the Biden administration's multifaceted approach to its relationship with Russia, you know, engaging, using the tools. And you mentioned, obviously, the efforts uh, to reach out to Russian society. I recall a number of years ago when a key program, which was the high school exchange program, was summarily cut off by, by Russia. And given that the space for engaging with Russian society in general is seems to be, you know, small and not very wide, what is your sense of the best way, not for the administration, but for outside entities to engage and how much space is there really to do this? 
the space is narrowing. Russian society is not like Soviet society, however. The repression from the Kremlin is getting into the Soviet range, but Russian society is not the same as Soviet society. Far more knowledgeable. I don't, I think public opinion polls in Russia are seldom to be trusted. Like, really, if a pollster asks you, do you support Putin? What do you think the safe answer is? Yeah. Um, I think to engage Russian society, you have to be flexible. You have to look at the available options, exchanges, outreach, um, virtual you know, internet support, support for independent journalism, which is difficult, but not impossible. Um, and speaking out, letting Russians know we're paying attention. So here's a story back from the 1980s. You remember Ronald Reagan's evil empire speech? Sure. And you remember how a lot of people thought, oh, my God, the Reagan is such a, a, a war monger and this is inflammatory and it's terrible. OK, so years later, I'm talking to this Polish government minister. Who was in prison. Um, when Reagan made the speech in a communist prison in Poland and he and his fellow political prisoners heard about Reagan's speech and he said they were we were elated because the Americans got it. And Poles, a lot of them, knew that this was important. The Americans weren't stupid. We weren't blind. We got it. And it was enormously important for them. So speak out. Now, at the time, nobody ever thought that communism would be overthrown in Poland or anywhere else. Nobody thought that. And support for the then Solidarity Underground was regarded as quixotic or worse, destabilizing. Yeah, but you remember that. <laughs> I remember that. I'm not. Our objective is not regime change. That is not in Russia. That is not our responsibility. It is not our goal. Reach out to Russian society. And it is up to Russians to figure out, you know, what to do. I'm not a big believer in. I'm not a believer in revolutions. You know, I'm much more the incremental reform and. Yeah, Make things work through negotiations. But it doesn't matter what we want. Um, we should remember that we should not forget the fallacy of thinking that what happens inside a country has nothing to do with its external behavior. Doesn't the 20th century teach us that internal repression is somehow related to external aggression? It's not perfect. It's not a one to one equality. But isn't it generally the case? Well, speaking of external aggression in my follow up, unless Charlie wants to jump in, which is the recent amassing of troops on the border with Ukraine. Um, you noted the actions that the Biden administration took working with its European uh, colleagues. In your view, was this the usual test or provocation by Russia? And how do you sense the US and the allies fared in the so-called, I'm using the term standoff. So I wanted to get your assessment, to get on your that. assessment on that. You remember, and I bet you the Finns remember, Lenin's famous saying, thrust in the bayonet. If you encounter fat, keep pushing. If you encounter steel, pull back. The it may be that Putin ordered the buildup, not certain what he would do next. He did it keeping his options open to test our reaction, to see what opportunities opened up, to put pressure on us. He was not, I don't think he did it committed to an invasion or determined not to attack. I think he wanted to keep his options open and find out whether the West was asleep. Good news, we weren't asleep. 
the Biden administration coordinated its actions and all the senior national security people in the administration called their Russian counterparts in a single day. That shows coherence and operational effectiveness. Um, Merkel called Putin, I think a couple of times about this issue. We prepared, I think we were preparing actions and internally debating military options. I don't mean send you as sending US troops, of course not, but weapons. This was being discussed. I think the story of the Biden administration um, pulling back, sending a couple of uh, warships into the Black Sea was a mistake. I'm, I'm, I hope, you know, I'm sorry to hear about that. But with that exception, the administration was pretty strong. And I think Putin took the measure and backed off. That doesn't mean it's backing off forever. There are various ways in which the Kremlin can put pressure on Ukraine. Ukraine, however, because of its willingness and capability of making a fight of it, of defending itself, is principally responsible for the fact that Putin turned back. We helped because we made clear that Ukraine does not stand alone. And, you know, the Finns know about this also. You know, to this day, I think the United States bears responsibility for what happened in 1939 because we were absent. We were absent. We left the French and the Germans to take care of Hitler and Stalin. What the hell were we thinking? You know, this, this is something we've all had to think of. We American policymakers have all had to think about. And it means solidarity is important. And it means the, the neo-isolationists of today are as wrong now as they were then. But that doesn't mean that all actions are justified. You know, a theory of solidarity will not prevent you from doing stupid stuff. But we need to, we need to be smart, but we need to be not asleep. We need to be not asleep. If I can jump in there with a follow-up question to this um, from uh, Sinika Parviainen, uh, how do you see the significance of the Minsk agreements? Uh, are they completely redundant now? Uh, there's more opposition against these agreements than in Russia. I assume she means in some European countries, maybe, or US. Uh, should there be new negotiations, uh, or is it likely in any scenario? In any scenario? The Minsk agreements are flawed. They're ambiguous. They can be exploited. They're not as good as they should be, but look, they're an awful lot better than the six point ceasefire plan uh, that the French negotiated between Georgia and Russia in 2008. The Minsk agreements for all their problems do recognize that the Donbass is sovereign Ukrainian territory. That's a big deal. And for all their flaws, if Putin wanted a deal, he could get one within the Minsk agreements. If he doesn't want a deal, no perfect agreement is going to prevent, you know, is going to force him to do it. The Minsk agreements are not the key variable. I had this discussion with Kurt Volker, who is the, you know, the, the ambassador Kurt Volker, old friend and colleague of many years standing, who is the able special envoy on Ukraine. And that was his view and I share it. He's right. The Minsk agreements are flawed. Their flaws are not dispositive. If Putin wants to deal, if he wants a deal on Ukraine, he can get a deal on Ukraine. You know, I, when, the, when the Russians want to not find a solution, they are very good at not finding a solution. But I've occasionally negotiated with the Russians when they want a solution. And boy, are they good. Whew. You know, capable, creative, you know, easy to work with, smart as hell. They just don't want a solution right now. They want one, they can get one. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah? Yes. 
Um, well, this is possibly a wrap up question. Um, in its latest assessment, the US intelligence community states that Moscow will use many tools, influence campaigns, intelligence and counterterrorism, cooperation, military aid, exercises, mercenary operations, et cetera, et cetera, to advance its interests or undermine the interests of the United States and its allies. What economic tools besides sanctions are available to shape Russian behavior and where are there fruitful opportunities to work closer together with our European partners? In addition to sanctions, um, one tool that comes to mind is export controls. We started that in 2014. There are cutting edge technologies that the Russians need to exploit, for example, um, Arctic offshore and deep sea oil um, or tight oil, meaning shale and other and related uh, forms of oil. That, and we impose those. We imposed restrictions on military and dual use technologies. We ought to look at this. We did this during the Cold War. And unfortunately, Putin is taking us back to this. Um, we also, and we discussed earlier, financial transparency drawing up channels of corrupt Russian money. Let's go after this stuff. Um, the, there are many ways in which we could reduce Russia's ability to raise capital for longer term investment projects. Okay, but on, on a scale of one to 10, what our sanctions are maybe a three and a half. They could go up, they could go up. Those are the economic tools. Um, by the way, Toria Newland, who's if she if the Senate confirms her is going to be the number three person at the State Department, wrote an article last summer arguing for a positive U.S. Russia economic agenda. If Russia makes that possible, so let me just stipulate that it's a good idea to start thinking about a better future, not just the the bad present. What could we do with Russia? Let's think about that. Let's not assume that Putinism is forever, right? Let's start thinking about a better future with a better Russia. I think it is possible. Okay, I wrote, you know, Sandy Vershbow, our former ambassador to Russia, former ambassador to NATO. He and I wrote a paper about our attempt in the 90s to work with the post, you know, the, the Yeltsin, Yeltsin's Russia and how, how much we, we achieved and how we failed. And our point was, let's not assume that Putinism is forever. We have to deal with it now, but it is possible to think of a better Russia. I am not one of these people who thinks that Russians are somehow ill-suited for democracy. I think that just borders on the on bigotry. If Ukrainians can support a functioning democracy, which they already have, even though the rule of law is kind of respected there as it should be, well, if the Ukrainians can have a, a rough democratic system, why not Russia? Okay, why not? Um, it is possible to think of a better Russia. And we need to start thinking about all the contingencies, good and bad, short term and long term. And I, as I said, I'm not one of these cynics who believes that Russians are capable of nothing better than Putinism. Nonsense. Nonsense. But don't listen to me. Listen to Vladimir Karamurza or Vladimir Milov, two leaders of the Russian Democratic opposition. What, are they not Russian? Do they not represent a stream of Russian thinking for 200 years of sort of liberal democratic thought? And occasionally that stream advances. It's not always on the margins. Anyway, I, I know it may sound odd that someone who advocates such a tough line against Putinism will talk about such optimistic possibilities for Russia, but I, I believe that to be the case. I'm not in the majority here among Russia, you know, uh, Russia hands, but I will defend that position. Thank you. If I could jump, in, I could here jump in here with a... a 
question, question uh, per, uh, from Akhtaharian. Thanks, 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 thanks for interesting talk. Interesting talk. Looking, back Looking back at developments, developments since 2014, 2014 what can we what learn, can about, we learn the about the economic, economic and, political and political ability of ability Russia, of to, Russia adapt to adapt and learn to, and live, learn with to live with sanctions? And then since and I then know since we are know soon, we're soon uh, or it looks like uh, Deborah, looks might, like be Deborah might be ending this. I'd be interested, I'd be interested in, in both of your both perspectives of your perspective. what we might learn from this um, if you project it to sanctions in China. Microphone. We'd have to have a whole other session on set for, to cover sanctions in China. But for, with respect to the question about Russia's ability to adapt to sanctions, sure, there's some ability to do so. Of course there is. The Russians will claim that sanctions have absolutely no effect. Let's dismiss that as, as cheap Kremlin propaganda. There is some ability to get used to sanctions, but also sanctions, if applied consistently, can have a cumulative effect over time by reducing Russian access to capital, reducing its financial options. This sort of stuff adds up. The Russian economy is stagnant. By the way, Thane Gustafson, the, you know, the economic, the scholar of the Russian economy is writing a book and hint, he's looking at the future of oil and gas exports and it doesn't look so good. It shouldn't surprise anybody. What's going to happen in a green economy? So, yeah, at the margins, Russia has the ability to some extent to deal with sanctions. But strategically, where is Russia going? Well, down a narrowing and darkening tunnel. Its economy is stagnant. Its politics are authoritarian. It is massively corrupt. It is relying more and more on repression. It is isolated in the world. It has alienated the Czechs. Who are sounding these days like the Poles. Where's this? They don't have friends. It is going to occur to, in fact, I bet it is already occurring to Russians that Putin is not good for Russia. Putin is not good for Russia. And we need to realize that Russians have some agency and they're not stupid, they, they're thinking. Think for themselves, even under authoritarian circumstances. And with respect to China, look, um, it's hard to argue against sanctions with respect to the repression of the Uyghurs or Hong Kong. OK, the, those sanctions are here to stay. They probably should, should be. But general sanctions against the overall Chinese economy are going to be difficult to sustain. Rather than looking at sanctions as a principal tool for dealing with China, I think they are a, an auxiliary tool for human rights abuses and other kinds of abuses. I think the better way to deal with the China challenge is for the US, the EU, and the other G7 countries to get together and set common regulatory standards to make it more difficult for China to gain the international system and to cheat. IPR protections, other kinds of protections, that's the ticket. I mean, there's nothing better than working with the Commission on Regulatory Issues because they're so good. And together, think about it. If the U.S. and the EU are setting global standards, we still have the high ground in terms of economic strength. So it's not a question of sanctions. It's a question of other economic tools. Now, I'm not an expert in this area, but like sanctioning, you know, let's think of the tools that might work at less cost. Anyway, that's another discussion. I'll just jump in and say I agree on the regulatory side. I mean, the future should be in shaping the rules of the game going forward, shaping new institutions, working you know, with our allies and partners. Well, I was going to add, unless Charlie, you want to jump in, I was going to add one last question. But Charlie, do you have something in the in the pipeline here, in the pipeline to use mm -hmm. a term? No, no okay. nothing in the pipeline. Okay. Well, to, I want to ask you about messaging. Obviously, in uh, our foreign policy, how we message is extremely important. 
How would you assess the so far the Biden's administration to message on its policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, including its ability to fight disinformation? So there's there's two aspects to this. Um, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I think Tori Newland and Karen Dunfried, the nominees for undersecretary and assistant secretary, are going to carry this policy. They're really good and they work well together. They're experienced. They have enormous credibility in Europe. Um, I, I think they will be able to take the, the framework of the Biden administration policy, which I think is the right one, and flesh it out. And I think they will, they will have credibility with the Europeans because this is a pro-EU administration. And I think they're right. Now, disinformation. Look, Finland is host to the hybrid center, this NATO EU center, which is great. I mean, and, and the fact that it was, you know, sort of the course initial staff were Finnish special forces people. I mean, that's, yeah, that's exactly what you want. You want people who understand the problem and are serious. The way Finland is serious quiet sometimes, but serious about Russia. <clears throat> we need, you know, there's a, there's a lot more that can be done with respect to counter disinformation. And I think the commission with its code of practice is on to something. I think we ought to be, the US and Europe ought to be working together to look at options for regulatory you know, regulatory reform with respect to um, online media. There are ways to do this, which is, and I do not mean content control, but I mean transparency and authenticity. That is, if you pretend to be someone online, you should be that person online. Um, so there are ways to get at this systematically. And this is the the. I think the Biden administration will take a look at this, but we're in better shape than we were. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dan, for joining our our webinar, and for Charlie for hosting us all under under FIA, um, that has done tremendous work in all the fields that we've been discussing today. And I'll turn it over to Charlie for the wrap up here. Uh, it'll be a quick wrap up, just to say thank you to Deborah and thank you to Daniel for great content. Of course, thank you to everyone who participated, asked questions. Um, without an audience, we wouldn't have anything to do. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again in about a month. Webinar is now closed. You're here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Everybody, have a great week.